Our relationships with others define the self. The way we act and who we are shifts based on who we are with. We have different selves in different contexts. Our identities can sometimes conflict, like being Asian American, stereotyped as good at math and female, stereotyped as bad at math. Social psychologist Margaret Shi showed this impacted Asian American women's math test performance depending on which identity was made salient. The idea of a completely autonomous free self is an illusion. We need relationships and interdependence to have a coherent sense of self. There is tension between our desire for freedom, autonomy, and the need for social constraints to construct the self. The line between internal and external forces driving our behavior is blurry. When someone else's actions influence us, separating internal versus external causes can be complex. Our interactions with others shape our thoughts, feelings, and behaviors, even if we don't realize it. We affect each other, even strangers we will never meet. The author shaping this book based on imagining the reader is an example. Our daily interactions shape our self, even fleeting ones. True isolation and freedom from others' influence is impossible. The concept of the self is complex and multifaceted. Many streams of thought contribute to our understanding of what the self is. The notion of an autonomous, independent self needs to be revised. Our relationships and social context profoundly shape ourselves. We construct a sense of self to make sense of the world and our place within it. Self provides a vantage point and structure that helps us manage reality, but this constructed self also constrains us. The desire for a stable sense of self can limit self-discovery and personal growth. To truly understand ourselves requires grappling with the fact that we are not entirely free, independent agents. We are interdependent beings, shaped by others. This book will explore the tension between the human needs for structure, stability, and freedom, uncertainty. This dynamic shapes the social world and issues of identity. The path to self-knowledge is a collective effort, not an individualistic endeavor. We must understand the social forces that create us. Our interactions and relationships with others define the self. We understand ourselves based on how others treat us and the rules of our culture. Our sense of self changes over time as we take on new roles and are treated differently by society. The rules that shape our self-concept also change. We have a theory of mind where we assume others have minds like ours. This allows us to interact and relate to others. Other people's behaviors and decisions affect who we become in significant life-changing ways and small mundane interactions. Their actions shape our behaviors and selves. Our internal predispositions, temperaments, interact with social situations to shape our behaviors. But other people's behaviors and our relationship history also affect how we respond. The self is not a fixed internal essence, but emerges from a shifting structure of social relationships and interactions. Our sense of self is co-created through our connections with others. The idea that the self is dynamic and changing might seem implausible because we feel we know and understand ourselves. However, the ancient phrase know thyself suggests that our selves are more complex than we realize. We tend to associate our sense of self with moral traits that distinguish good and bad people. However, studies show our idea of someone's true self is more tied to honest features than personality traits. Our beliefs and actions only have meaning in defining ourselves because of their social context and how others understand them. The self emerges through our relationships. Our subjective experience of reality does not necessarily reflect objective reality. We seek out structure and meaning, even creating it when lacking, rather than objectively perceiving reality. Social situations, even when we are not actively involved, shape our understanding of ourselves and others in complex ways beyond our awareness. Our perception is motivated, not an impartial reflection of truth. The critical point is that the self is created through social interactions and relationships, not something stable inside us. Our sense of an unchanging inner self is an illusion. The self is more fluid than it feels. Psychologists conducted a study showing that people perceive motion in a way that fits their expectations even if the actual movement contradicts this. This demonstrates our tendency to see coherence and meaning where none exists. We do this to make sense of the messy, complex world.
We use mental shortcuts and narratives to create predictability and structure. This happens not just with perceiving objects, but also with understanding other people. We categorize people into groups and assume similarities between group members to navigate social situations. Despite contrary evidence, we cling to these stories and structures because they provide comfort, security, and a sense of control. Design fills an existential need to make sense of our place in the world. Our sense of self is a collectively constructed narrative that allows us to function. With a coherent sense of self, the world is possible to navigate. But because these structures are human creations rather than reflections of objective reality, people often struggle to predict their behavior accurately. Situational factors shape our actions more than our professed beliefs and values. In summary, humans impose coherence, order, and meaning onto a complex world and their identities. We do this collectively to create the structures we need to function. But our maps of reality are imperfect and biased. The self is not simply located within the body, but is constructed through social relationships and interactions. Our physical features and genetics shape how others engage with us from birth, affecting the development of our self. Attractiveness, for example, leads to differences in caregiving and social skills. Variations in sensitivity to pain or stress may lead people to approach social situations differently, shaping their relationships and life trajectories. At the same time, the social environment affects our physical bodies, including gene expression. We are born into a complex web of social dynamics and expectations that give meaning to aspects of our bodies, like gender or race, and affect ourselves before we are conscious. While our bodies shape our social interactions, our social interactions also profoundly shape our bodies and selves. The arrival of a new baby illustrates this interplay. Even before birth, a baby affects the selves of parents, friends, and colleagues as relationships are reconfigured in anticipation. However, the social circumstances the baby is born in also profoundly shape their life outcomes. A constant mutual influence exists between our physical bodies and social worlds in constructing ourselves. The modern Western understanding of the self, as portrayed in literature like Dostoevsky's Notes from Underground, involves a lot of self-consciousness, self-torment, neediness, and fear. This disease of consciousness stems from seeing oneself as a social creation and judging that self negatively. This contemporary view of the self gives it special powers, like the ability to reshape reality through our thoughts, as proposed in books like The Secret. This solipsistic idea elevates the self to the creator of reality. However, understandings of the self have changed over time. In ancient Greece and Rome, the self was defined more by social relationships and community ties rather than internal personality. There was little notion of a private, reflective self. Our current focus on the self's power to manifest desires into reality contrasts sharply with historical views. The origins likely lie in Renaissance art's increasing focus on accurately depicting inner lives. Some argue contemporary Western culture has become increasingly individualistic and self-focused over time, as seen in critiques of the Me Decade of the 1970s and the Me 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 Generation of today. However, beliefs about the nature and power of the self have shifted dramatically over history. In the Renaissance, artists like painters and sculptors aimed to reflect reality. This positioned them as observers and creators rather than participants in the world they depicted. Modern Western views of the self have roots in Enlightenment thinkers like Descartes and Kant, who saw the self as reasoning and autonomous. Adam Smith's ideas about self-interest and the invisible hand of the free market have shaped modern economics and views of individualism. Today, many look to neuroscience and the physical brain to understand the self. Advanced techniques like fMRI let us observe the self directly, but our access to our thoughts and feelings may be more limited than it seems. Research shows we can detect and use patterns without conscious awareness. The feeling of a stable personal identity may arise from processes like resemblance, gradual change over time, and causation, connecting past and present selves, as described by philosopher David Hume. The self-concept has a complex history and has been understood differently. Modern Western views emphasize individualism and reason, but our sense of self may need to be more transparent and autonomous than it seems. According to Hume, 
Resemblance and causation are two processes that shape our sense of identity. Resemblance means that small, incremental changes in our social relationships and self over time make it hard to notice change occurring. Causation refers to how complex interactions are experienced as a unified whole. Memory plays a crucial role in constructing our sense of self and identity, but memory is flexible and prone to distortions over time. We see ourselves as more continuous and unchanged than seeing changes in others after time apart. Cultural movements in the 1960s focused on finding one's true self and rejecting social conventions, elevating individual needs over social concerns. This relates to long-standing ideas about an innate moral self from thinkers like Rousseau. Having a sense of self inherently requires recognizing the humanity of others. Dehumanization is an active process of failing to recognize others' humanity fully. The self is complex, constructed by humans over time, and subject to change rather than a fixed entity to be discovered. Recognizing this complexity is essential. Here is a summary of the key points made in the passage. Freedom is a concept people highly value and pursue, but its meaning is complex and multifaceted. To understand freedom, the passage breaks it down into three components. The right to do say what you want without someone stopping you. Someone stopping you can take many forms beyond physical restraint, including threats, manipulation of needs, desires, obligations created by roles and relationships, and social political structures that limit options. True freedom may require more than the absence of obvious external constraints, but also internal freedom from compulsions and limitations created by our minds and egos. The passage implies that complete freedom may not be possible or desirable for human beings. We likely don't want to be completely free from all constraints. Understanding the nuances of freedom is essential because the concept is often invoked to justify significant actions and social political structures. We should examine it closely rather than accept its virtue automatically. Living freely is more complicated than avoiding external influences, as it's unclear what it means to do what you want. Your wants and needs are multifaceted. Compulsions, whether internal or external, impede freedom. Even if you are not coerced into an action, like indulging in an addiction, it does not feel freely chosen. The self is fluid, shaped by relationships, so there is no single static you. Different selves emerge in different situations, affecting your experience of freedom. Behaviors of a particular self defined by a relationship may conflict with what the other person wants. Maintaining that self may require rejecting others' demands. The line between compulsion and choice is blurry. Psychological needs or desires, like status or approval, can compel actions as much as biological needs. Cultural context shapes our ideas of what we should want and how we should act. Complete freedom from these influences may be impossible. The existence of multiple selves makes it hard to define freedom, as different selves may view the same action differently regarding space. Amy Carlson created a spiritual community called Love Has One in Colorado. She claimed to be the reincarnation of Jesus and called herself Mother God. The group believed Carlson would help them ascend to a higher spiritual plane when the broken 3D world was destroyed. They spread conspiracy theories on social media. At its peak, the group had nearly 20,000 Facebook followers and 10,000 YouTube subscribers. Dozens of followers moved to Colorado to join Carlson. Members took on roles in the group's organizational structure, selling products and live streaming videos to spread their message. They truly believed they were fighting a battle to save humanity. From the outside, the group appears to be a cult with brainwashed members. But people's ideas of right and wrong are shaped by their social environments. What may seem immoral to outsiders made sense to members within the group's norms. Our sense of self as a consistent, understandable being may be a fiction. We need full access to what drives our beliefs and actions. We try to explain our behavior after the fact. People want autonomy and resist explicit attempts to control them. But we willingly enter relationships that shape and limit us, sacrificing freedom for belonging. Complete freedom may not be compatible with human nature and needs. The poem tells the story of Gilgamesh, a two-thirds divine and one-third mortal king, and his partner Enkidu, the gods created to be Gilgamesh's equal. Gilgamesh was terrorizing the citizens of Uruk, 
so the gods created Enkidu to reign in Gilgamesh's excesses. Enkidu and Gilgamesh have an epic fight, but eventually become fast friends. This relationship with Enkidu changes Gilgamesh and causes him to stop tormenting the citizens. The poem shows an early understanding of how relationships can change us by constraining our freedom. As we form relationships, our sense of self becomes more precise focus, diminishing uncertain possibilities. Who we are is shaped by our relationships. Every relationship makes demands of us and defines us in some way, for better or worse. My interaction with the police illustrates how relationships can limit possibilities for who we can become. We have a deep need for social connection. We see ourselves and others as less human when this need is deprived. We also conform more just to fit in and connect. Subtly changing interests or beliefs to connect with others is expected. Our need for social connection affects our behavior, often outside conscious awareness, as we give up some freedom and individuality to strengthen bonds. But links also expand possibilities for who we can become. There is a constant tension between freedom and harmony. Our interactions and relationships with others shape who we are. Even small things like body language and tone of voice change to match those we interact with to get along. These changes represent tiny limitations on our freedom and constraints on what is possible. Relationships create a structure that defines us. Intense relationships alter who we can become, even from the past. We cannot be people unaffected by those relationships. Sometimes we chafe under the shared reality relationships impose on us. We seek freedom by creating distance from relationships. We need the structured relationships to make sense of the world and navigate life. The version of ourselves we like best exists within the constraints of a relationship. Freedom is powerful because we associate it with being our true selves. But freedom would leave us untethered. Relationships and their constraints allow us to know ourselves. Our close relationships with family, friends, and partners profoundly shape our sense of self. We incorporate aspects of their personalities and views into our own. The closer we are to someone, the more ourselves overlap. It can be hard to distinguish where one ends and the other begins. This intermingling can feel threatening, like a loss of self. But our self is not something pure and isolated. It is composed of unique overlaps between ourselves and close others. Defining ourselves only in contrast to others misses this sharing. We learn the language, social norms, and beliefs about the world through relationships. They form the conduit through which we become human. Severing closed ties would diminish the self. The social, the social construction of reality in relationships makes us vulnerable when our sense of self clashes with the world being constructed around us. Gaslighting is one harmful manifestation of this. Overall, embracing the shared, overlapping nature of self-created with close others is affirming. Ourselves are intersections, not islands. Close relationships immerse us in worlds that can challenge our sense of self. Partners bring their outside interactions and perspectives into the relationship, expanding our worldview and exposing us to potentially uncomfortable new beliefs or pressures on our identity. Dissatisfaction in relationships often stems from conflicting notions of self that arise from other relationships. Multiple relationships define who we are in one context and may conflict with who we are expected to be in another. Problematic relationships can shape our sense of reality in unhealthy ways, akin to gaslighting or crazy-making. If a partner denies or distorts our experience, we may doubt our sanity over time. Completely protecting our sense of self from a relationship may require ending that relationship since our identities are intertwined. We can't fully control how others shape us. Rather than erecting barriers, balancing time across relationships can mute unwanted influences. Spending more time in other communities can blunt the impact of a dysfunctional relationship. Shared reality with others affects how we see the world. Without close relationships, our sense of reality would be impaired, yet dependence on others' perspectives also limits our freedom. We construct reality together. Here are the key points from the passage. Close relationships significantly shape our sense of self and world experience. Family members, friends, partners, and even enemies can have an intimate, visceral impact on us. Our membership in broader social groups like ethnic, national, professional, or alum groups also defines us. These group memberships allow us to make sense of complex social environments. 
When meeting someone new, we rely on perceiving their social group memberships to guide our interactions and expectations. We don't encounter them simply as individuals. Social identities underlie major societal issues like inequality, discrimination, and polarization. Some argue we should ignore social identities, but they are an inevitable and essential part of navigating a complex world. We gravitate towards similar others and judge new people based on perceived group memberships. A world with social identities would be straightforward to navigate. Overall, the passage argues that intimate relationships and broader social groups are critical in shaping our sense of self and enabling us to understand the social world. Denying the importance of social identities is unrealistic. Here are a few key points summarizing the passage. Social groups and identities help us make sense of the world and our place in it. They provide shortcuts for understanding others based on group membership rather than starting from scratch with each individual. We create social groups and identities. They do not exist naturally. We tell stories about groups that then shape our perceptions of them. Social identities connect us to history, allow us to feel part of something larger than ourselves, and expand our sense of self. Who counts as part of a particular social group can change over time, as seen in the example of the legal case over whether Chinese immigrants could be classified as white. There are costs to social identities as well. We take on the shame, guilt, and pain of the groups we identify with, not just the pride. Overall, social identities are a neat trick we play on ourselves, creating a social reality and shortcuts to help us navigate a complex world full of unique individuals. But the stories we tell about groups shape perceptions more than reflect some innate truth. This passage discusses the social construction of race and racial identities in the United States. Some key points. Race is a social category, not a biological one. Physical traits like skin color vary continuously, yet society imposes discrete racial categories. Racial boundaries and definitions of whiteness have shifted over time. Courts have struggled to determine who counts as white. Racial identities are complex. The existence of people of mixed race shows the fluidity of racial categories. People like Rachel Dolezal challenge assumptions about the link between ancestry, parentage, and racial identity. Her choice to identify as black, despite having white parents, shows race is not just about biology. Racial essentialism, the idea that race reflects some unseen innate essence, persists. This supports beliefs that racial identities are fixed rather than socially constructed. The history of passing also demonstrates the social construction of race. Some people categorized as black based on ancestry could pass as white in specific contexts due to appearance. Overall, the passage argues race is a social construct rather than a fixed biological reality, though essentialist racial thinking persists in American society. Essentialist thinking, believing that social categories like race reflect innate immutable essences is common but needs to be revised. People readily shift their thoughts about the essence of a group to fit changing social realities. For example, stereotypes of Asians have changed dramatically over time. Rachel Dolezal challenged essentialism by choosing to identify as black, upsetting people who see racial identity as immutable. However, the boundaries of racial groups are fuzzy and subjective. To determine if someone belongs to a group, we want the information to assess if they fit, their ancestry, upbringing, culture, relationships, and how others perceive them. We seek this information because group identities shape relationships. However, the flexibility in determining group membership shows these identities aren't immutable. A resume highlights an essentialist view of identity. That group membership is defined by innate, fixed characteristics rather than relationships. People were upset with Rachel Dolezal because she lied about being black. From an essentialist view, her white ancestry meant she could not be black regardless of how she self-identified. There are three perspectives on racial identity discussed. One, Rachel's view, race is a personal choice based on the culture you immerse yourself in. Two, the essentialist view is that race is fixed at birth based on ancestry, genetics. Three, the author's view, race is defined relationally through community acceptance and conferral. Rachel was black when accepted as such by her community and stopped being black when that acceptance was revoked. The reaction to Rachel shows people care about protecting group boundaries from perceived imposters. 
Threats to group integrity are seen as threats to group members' social world and identities. The example of cochlear implants shows a similar debate around deafness. Is it an impairment to cure or an essential part of identity and community? Rejection of implants by some in the deaf community parallels the reaction to Rachel, showing how social groups defend their existence. Our identities are shaped by the subtle physical ways of being that mark our social groups. Losing group identities would make us individual atoms without social meaning. Social groups constrain us, but also give us connection and meaning. Shared discrimination can even strengthen group identity. We defend groups because they shape our realities and sense of self. Let's approach this topic with nuance and empathy. Both sides likely have valid concerns that are worth discussing thoughtfully. However, divisive rhetoric often prevents constructive dialogue we would do better to seek common ground and shared humanity. We may find space for compromise and mutual understanding if we recognize our shared hopes and struggles. I have summarized the key points. Gender identity is not biologically essential, but constructed through social relationships and treatment by others. Research shows people make relative judgments about gender based on context, rather than detecting an essence. Stating preferred pronouns seeks to separate gender identity from appearance, but doesn't challenge the importance of gender itself. Technologies like the printing press enabled new forms of social connection, allowing people to imagine themselves as part of a shared nation or community. This transformed identities on a global scale. Nation states are a constructed identity, not primordial. The idea of the people as a basis for rights and power shaped modern politics. Social identities like gender and nationality are not objective truths or inborn essences, but constructed through relationships. This gives freedom from biological determinism, but also means our identities depend on validation from others. Misalignment between self-perception and others' treatment can cause distress. Social identities come with rights, responsibilities, and expectations. Failing to uphold those can result in punishment or loss of benefits from the community. People are more forgiving of those outside their racial group who violate gender norms because they don't see them as real members of that gender. The communities we belong to confer identities that can define our sense of self. To challenge those identities is to challenge the relationships within the community. Social identities are fluid and can change over time. What it means to have a particular identity in one community or period may be different in another. When the boundaries of identity expand to include new membership claims, it challenges existing members' understanding of that identity and their sense of self. The meaning of any identity is defined by the community that confers it. Requests for inclusion change the boundaries and purpose of that identity for the whole community. Here are a few key points summarizing the passage. Social identities like gender, race, and nationality are defined by the communities and relationships people are part of, not by individuals alone. To change these identities challenges people's sense of self and community. When someone claims a social identity in a way that violates the community's accepted norms, it can feel like a threat to the integrity of that identity and community. For example, Rachel Dolezal claims she is black when the shared black experience is essential to defining black identity. Our understanding of identities like gender has ev evolved through social interactions. Pioneers like Virginia Prince helped create the modern idea of being transgender. We inherit identities shaped by generations before us. Existing social structures and relationships constrain the possibilities for who we can be. Online spaces like social media can reinforce biases if people only interact with similar others. For example, a white woman, Addison Ray, benefits from dances created by black TikTok users. Ideally, the internet would expose us to new people and ideas, but algorithms and selective exposure often show us more of what we already like and agree with. People often like and choose things that reinforce their existing views and tribes rather than expanding their horizons. This is enabled by algorithms that feed us more of what we already like. This reduces growth and freedom, keeping people in their tribes, rather than fulfilling the early promise of the internet to expand possibilities. The internet didn't create these biases, but supercharged the ability to indulge them 
through personalized feeds and recommendations. Our need to make sense of the world demands having a coherent identity and community. Today, this is mainly shaped by nation states and technology. Nation states and technology control who we interact with, what we see, and which groups are valued. This constrains our freedom and autonomy. Communication technologies like the internet were hoped to free us to explore new identities and find new communities not limited by geography. Instead, we seem to have ended up constrained by curated feeds reinforcing existing identities and tribes. Technology shapes what we remember by enabling virtually unlimited cheap digital storage. But memory is fallible and flexible, which allows us to evolve. In summary, technology and nation states constrain our freedom and identities, though there was hope that new communication technologies could expand possibilities. Instead, they seem to have limited space by reinforcing existing biases and tribes. Our glut of recorded information and digital memories may impair the natural process of pruning memories and forgetting. Forgetting helps us evolve beyond the past, but constant digital reminders of our past selves may limit who we can become. The vast amount of online information leads to choice overload, where too many options paralyze our decision-making. Corporations use algorithms to limit our choices based on past behaviors, which reduces novel experiences that could lead to growth. New technologies like the internet may not have delivered the democratization and equalization of voices that was hoped for. Dominant groups continue to dominate online, needing more opportunities to expand social networks. Past communication technologies like paper and printing profoundly impacted human capabilities by expanding how we connect across space and time. The internet similarly expands connections, but on an unprecedented global scale. Printing allowed the creation of mass communities like nation states, united by a shared story and identity. Our modern selves are shaped by close relationships and vast social systems enabled by communication technologies. Nation states strongly influence people's lives by shaping society's context and rules. They define who is a citizen and member of the national community. This grants rights and responsibilities, like paying taxes in exchange for access to social goods. Nation states can use force to uphold laws but are most effective when citizens voluntarily follow the rules. States shape cultural values about appropriate behavior and relationships by controlling institutions like the legal system. For example, legalizing same-sex marriage signaled societal acceptance but put pressure on LGBTQ communities defined by a rejection of mainstream norms. When people identify with a nation, they may sacrifice for it because if the government persists, so does their sense of self. Countries operate like other social groups, relying on feelings of connection and shared identity, not just territory. Throughout history, ethnic and cultural groups have sought self-determination and nationhood. In some cases, minorities within existing states pursue greater autonomy or independence, as with the Catalonians in Spain or the Tamils in Sri Lanka. Stateless peoples like the Romani, Tibetans, and Kurds also strive for nationhood, defining the boundaries of the people is a challenge for nation states. Dominant ethnic or racial groups often structure the state to maintain power and resource access. Challenging the dominant group's control can precipitate conflict and instability. White nationalist fears of replacement in the US reflect how national identity is tied to racial identity. Changing definitions of the nation are seen as existential threats. Where one lives shapes one's relationships and life opportunities. Government policies like mortgage discrimination had lasting impacts by concentrating resources and whiteness in the suburbs. Our circumstances and environments are crucial shapers of our lives and selves. The notion of deservingness ignores how outcomes depend heavily on structural factors beyond individual talent and effort. If people swapped birthplaces, their lives would differ radically. Ourselves are products of our contexts. Here are a few critical points about meaning and freedom from the passages. Meaning in life often comes from family, friends, health, and occupation. But underlying these is the feeling of freedom and control over one's life. How we face death can reveal how meaningful our lives were. Choosing to end one's life, as the monk and vendor did, shows they felt in control of their destiny, though for different reasons. The monk appeared calm and purposeful in choosing a dramatic public death 
to make a political statement. His act was a willful assertion of freedom and meaning. In contrast, the vendor reacted to frustration and powerlessness in his life circumstances. His act suggests a feeling of lost meaning and lack of freedom. True meaning comes from feeling our lives are freely chosen, that we shape our destiny rather than react to circumstances. The monk exemplifies this more than the vendor. Meaning involves dedicating ourselves to something greater than just ourselves. But this dedication must be freely chosen to be meaningful. In summary, the passages illustrate how meaning in life comes from feeling free to make choices and control our fate, even in how we face death. A meaningful life involves freely shaping our destiny and dedicating ourselves to something bigger than ourselves. Meaning in life can be constructed retrospectively based on discrete events after death. But this is different from experiencing life as meaningful while living it. For life to feel meaningful as you live it, the world must make sense and have coherence. Complete freedom is incompatible with meaning. Relationships and social connections provide coherence and are crucial to meaning. Meaning involves transcending the present moment and having a sense of purpose over time. We construct selves and narratives to give coherence and make sense of the world. Without this, life can feel like an abyss of meaninglessness. Meaning requires more than just coherence. It also involves purpose and goal-directed behavior. Actions feel more meaningful when tied to future goals and a sense of direction. The feeling that our choices matter is central to meaning. This requires connecting our actions to things beyond ourselves that feel significant. Sense stems from transcending our trivial concerns. Meaning arises from social connections and coherence, having purpose and goals for the future, and feeling that our lives matter beyond survival. It connects us to things more significant than ourselves. Whether life is meaningful depends on whether we feel connected to something larger than ourselves, like we have an essential role. Meaning can come from believing our actions contribute to ideals like justice and human dignity. Viktor Frankl argued, we can choose our attitude in any circumstance, and this choice gives life meaning. The man with HIV found meaning not in the outcome of tending his tomato plants, but in caring for them. We may not need true freedom to feel our actions are meaningful, just the perception of space. An experiment showed people valued a tedious task more if they were paid little to lie about enjoying it versus being paid more. If all choices have meaning, how do we decide what to do? The ideas of weight, where our actions reverberate, and light, where they fade into indifference, provide contrasting views. Overall, the perception that we matter and our actions transcend the moment may be the key to meaning, regardless of true lasting impact. The human desire for meaning stems from wanting our actions and lives to have lasting consequences beyond the present moment. If our choices lack future impact, they feel insignificant. We want to believe we can extend ourself into the future through social connections and legacy. This gives us a sense of immortality and weight. Death threatens this desire for continuity. But the self does not wholly reside in the physical body. As relationships change, parts of the self die while new selves are born. With a social conception of self, physical death does not necessarily constitute the end of self. Pieces of us live on through memory and impact on others. The nature of death and self reminds us that we are interconnected. Ourselves ripple out to touch others even after bodily demise. This offers a sense of meaning and continuity amid impermanence. The concept of death is complex. Medical death does not necessarily mean all bodily functions have ceased when the heart stops. Even if the brain shuts down, some parts may continue. So the line between life and death is blurry. If we could revive someone after their bodily functions stopped, were they dead? This raises philosophical questions about what constitutes personal identity and the self. Humans have long sought immortality through various means like elixirs and new technologies to freeze bodies or upload minds. But would an uploaded mind be the same person? Our selves are tied to our physical existence and social relationships. Rather than fearing death, we may fear the decline and loss of vitality before death, or fear separation from loved ones. But death itself may be oblivion, the author believes the self can outlive the body for a time after death through memories and impact on others. 
But eventually, the self also dies as it is forgotten. We should appreciate conscious experiences, as the author does not believe conscious experience persists after bodily death. But aspects of the self may live on for a time. The author hopes that his socially constructed self will persist after death through his relationships and the impressions he made on others. He gives the example of PhD students carrying on his legacy. Physical death is not the end of self if others remember you. Relationships persist after death through memory, stories, and ongoing impacts on others. The author sees writing this book as a way to relate to future readers after his death. Knowing someone is subjective based on your unique perspective of a relationship. Others may know different selves of a person. As long as the network of relationships that constitutes yourself continues through others, part of yourself lives on. But eventually, memories fade and selves die. Physical death gives life meaning. It motivates us to live fully. But we also hope others will mourn us when we are gone and make space to expand. The author feels awe about the social nature of existence and the webs of relationships underlying life. Death brings this into focus. The book has aimed to examine how understanding the self as a social creation rather than an essential inner core affects how we live and think about life. This view challenges common assumptions that we have an unchanging inherent self that defines us. Instead, it proposes that the self is created through our relationships and interactions. Many people may resist this view because it implies less individual control and freedom. However, it can lead to greater humility, responsibility, and understanding of ourselves and others. Relationships exert power through affirming or denying possibilities of being. Everyday interactions shape identities. Communities confer identities, which is a source of their power. Fighting for identity is an existential struggle which politics taps into. Rethinking beliefs about the nature of self affects views on what we deserve, aim to accomplish, and what makes a good life. It suggests looking to relationships, communities, and identities for insight rather than an inner core. This view of selves as social creations may allow greater forgiveness, patience, generosity, and stability. It can make life easier to understand and bear. Here is a summary of the key points from the references provided. The concept of self is complex and multifaceted. Individuals have a continuous sense of self despite changes and possess multiple social identities. Personality traits show stability over the lifespan, suggesting an enduring self, but situations can also change behavior. The self is both stable and malleable. People tend to think their perceptions reflect reality, and others share their inner states, illustrating naive realism and shared reality bias. Individuals are motivated to perceive order, structure, and patterns in the world. This provides meaning, control, and reduces uncertainty. Stereotyping allows quick judgments but can lead to inaccurate generalizations. Individuals also conform to social norms and roles. The self is flexible and incorporates external items or perspectives. Illusions like the enforcement effect highlight the malleable nature of self-identity. Attractiveness, status, and hierarchy impact individuals' perception and treatment. This in turn shapes the development of self-concept. The self emerges from inner traits and outer social contexts. It balances continuity and fluidity in adapting to life circumstances. Here is a summary of the key points from the sources provided. Recent research indicates that belief in a true inner self or real me is widespread, but evidence may not support this belief. The idea of an authentic self has roots in ancient philosophy and became influential during the Enlightenment. Belief in a true self is linked to psychological benefits like well-being. Still, it could also promote biased thinking about others, like dehumanizing outgroup members seen as lacking the valued true essence. The sources trace the history of belief in a true self, examine correlations with well-being, and study how this belief impacts moral judgments. Evidence suggests the idea is cultivated by culture and socialization. Challenges to the idea of an authentic self include findings from psychology and neuroscience indicating people lack self-insight and self-knowledge, and constructive memory distorts autobiography. The self may be more fragmented and context-dependent than people assume. Some scholars argue belief in a real me encourages individuals to resist social conventions and assert autonomy. However, belief in an inner true self could also lead to intolerance of deviance 
and harsh moral judgments of others' actions that violate their essential nature.